like good for a longer period of time. Right. So let's say that I, I have I bring this to work and for whatever reason I go out for lunch yes. the next day because it's just peanut butter and because the bread has is so it, fresh. It has MRE no, bread. No, it's just, yeah, no, it's just, it just has so many preservatives, <laughs> which which my wife can't stand. She wants nothing to do with this. Right. And, uh, so uh, so if you get called out of town for a week, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Back. The and sandwich is right there on the table, ready to go. Or, no, or I have it in my in my case, and, <laughs> and I can just pull it out when I'm on the road somewhere right. and uh, get a little peckish. And uh, it, it, even the, even when it's compressed. Still tasty. Yeah, it's just the same number of calories and still the, really the same flavor. It's just, just the same flavor. Slightly different texture. Good That's right. It's a different texture. It it's really is an MRE. I mean, yeah, it's, right. it's just doesn't go bad. It's highly, wherever I needed to go. Highly portable. It's just uh, outstanding. Good, good protein. It's, Although my nutritionist got me off peanut butter into almond butter. I, I sometimes will mix it up okay. there, but I mean... But you know the the, the the cost effectiveness of almond butter versus, versus peanut, peanut butter. butter. <laughs> peanut butter is going to win every time. Yeah, you can, you buy like a vat of peanut butter for the price <laughs> of a small butter. container of almond butter. Correct. But uh, and the other thing is, is I'm not so sure about this this uh, longevity of the almond butter. Mm, I don't know versus the peanut butter. I'm not sure. What does almond butter going bad look like? I don't know. It's I, an oil. It's just yeah. I've never had it go bad. But I mean, okay, so have you made a sandwich and then not like eaten it for three days? No. <laughs> he okay, hasn't done any usability testing. I make a sandwich and I eat it. Yeah, <laughs> see, right. This is, see, this, yeah. is, this is part of the metric. Right. You've got to be so able you to... say you've never had it go bad really has no value because yeah. you've never allowed it to even try to <laughs> right. go bad. Right. So. <laughs> hmm. so I didn't know if the peanut butter sandwich was a cost savings mechanism. No, 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 no. no. It's just, it's just, it's just an, it, in a, you like it. It's just an efficient way of eating, and I like the taste of it. Yeah. It's just, I'm not going to apologize. No, I'm not. Sandwich. <laughs> That's great. Uh, hey, we've got uh, one of the Penske Indy cars. Oh, nice. We had Bud Denker on oh. from Penske last week, and uh, the Indy car showed up in uh, the mail. In the mail. Yeah, so, I was, I, so the other day, um, my wife and I were watching the news, and uh, lo and behold, I see Bud being interviewed, and I'm like, Oh, we just had him on the show. <laughs> and then uh, I had lunch with a friend of mine yesterday, and uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, the race coming up. And uh, mm -hmm. I said, oh, yeah, we had the guy who was in charge of it uh, on the show last week. And he goes, I saw him on TV yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Good to see him. So the that. guy gets around and sends cars. That's right. Mm -hmm. You got to appreciate guys like that. Mm-hmm. But you've got a pretty nice collection of uh, cast cars. Oh, yeah. And this is, you know, uh, we, we switch them out every now and then. We, we've got a bunch of cars. Okay. And, in fact, we typically have people, oh, I didn't even notice. Carmen's got the, the one on top, Brad Kozlowski's NASCAR okay. Mustang, which is an, another one that Bud sent. So, But, yeah, we, we move them all about. And uh, we have people come on the show, and they look at everything. They go, you don't have one of ours up there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a way of getting free cars. Well, we could have one of yours that's, if that's you would it. provide. That's how it works. Uh, every car's got a story. So th my favorite one is this old, old. it's a, a Toyota Model Double A. Okay. It's actually a cigarette holder, and if you press the steering wheel down, there's a lighter in the hood that it loves it, and it, it still works. I got that thing 25 years ago. I was in, uh, oh, what was the guy's name? Uh, he was the CEO of Toyota, and I, okay. I was in Japan doing an interview with him, and I happened to comment, what a cool model. And he goes, hey, it's a cigarette holder. Do you smoke here? You know? And I'm like, no, I don't smoke. Sure enough, I get back to my hotel room that night after dinner. There's there a box. the car wrapped up. That's great. I should have said a few more things. I like the chair. I like the lamp. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Be like the jerk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll be taking this layer. <laughs> yeah, and that car off there. That's really nice. That's, 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 that's a Toyota you got. That's right. You know, it's, it's like, Not the Toyota, the Lexus. <laughs> right. yeah. you know, that, that really looked nice in my driveway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd be so kind. Yeah, yeah right. I know that shipping can be a hassle, but boy, that really yeah, looks yeah, nice. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, 
Yeah, I was surprised when I was in, uh, I worked in China for three years uh, up in Chongchun where VW was a joint venture with FAW. Um, and I had a, got a cast car up there for uh, an old Chinese uh, red flag, Hongqi. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Their kind of luxury chauffeur. The limo. Vehicle, the limo, exactly. Um, it's like fantastic to see them actually having the same sense of, hey, people need to have something that they can kind of have on their desk or whatever to kind of cherish the, the history of the automotive experience, even in China, which is a much shorter right. automotive history. But right. that same mindset of, boy, this is just a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, I still have that on my desk uh, back in Hong They've just well. recently redesigned that. Yep. Yeah, the, it was the H7. I think this is now the H8. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, over the last 50 years, eight, eight different models. But, yeah, they're not afraid of technology over there. It's like, <laughs> there's a new way of doing something, they're willing to give it a yeah. shot. Mm -hmm. but, Okay, here we go. We're going to get started. <clears throat> Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by... Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. All right, Gary. How are you? I'm great. We get to do another show. We do. And uh, I should point out, we'll, we'll probably get to the subject a little later in the show, but today, is the 50th anniversary of Mario Andretti winning the Indianapolis 500. Today. Today. Wow. I remember May, when that May happened. May 30th, 1969. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, in a backup car. So. He, he crashed his, uh, his uh, primary car and uh, had, was forced into the backup and still managed to win the race. And Michael and Marco have been waiting. Never been able to do it. Ever since. I know. It's, it's like the Andretti luck at Indy has been abysmal. With that one win, mm -hmm. exception, you know, they led so many laps. They came so close so many times, but it yeah. didn't happen. So, well, let's let everybody know that our special guest today is Jeff Stout. He's the executive director of Innovation and New Mobility in North America for Yangfeng Automotive Interiors. And if any of you remember Jeff about a year ago, it was last August, we, yeah, had, we had him in the show. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was MBS. a great show. In fact, I'm almost tempted just to replay that show. <laughs> it was that good. It was fun. And so welcome back. Yeah, it's good to be here, John. Thanks, Gary. So, so, so for those of out there who don't know what Yang Feng is? Give us a little little, little thumbnail. I mean, it's I mean, it, it's it's a tremendously <laughs> huge company that sure. uh, is is astonishing. Even if I'm looking at the numbers here, it's just wow. Yeah, so Yanfeng uh, actually is a um, corporate entity. There's a Yanfeng Group that's part of the SAIC company, the automaker in China, based in Shanghai. Uh, and then they have a parts division inside of SAIC called Hasco, which has a division called Yanfeng Group, which has a division called Yanfeng Automotive Interiors, which is what I'm a part of. Um, that came about about two and a half years ago with the uh, joint um, connection of JCI Interiors and the Yanfeng Interiors that they had already in China. And so when they put those two together, it's a joint venture. 70% uh, Yanfeng um, and 30% JCI, which is now Adiant. Uh, the industry continues to change, the names change. Uh, but you put that all together and it's now a $10 billion global interior business. Uh, for me personally, I have been in interiors my entire career, 20 six years I guess it's been now. Uh, I started in Prince back in the day for the few people out there that are familiar with the history of interiors that started there with Ed Prince and the uh, the lit vanity uh, that they released with the Cadillac some uh, it's probably coming up on 40 years ago now and the development of Homelink and some of those other technologies so that then got bought by Adiant, uh, JCI then became Adiant then joint venture with Yanfeng um, and so at the end of the day people generally don't leave our industry it seems uh, you just change the name you change a little bit of what you're working on but in general uh, it's still a really committed group of people looking at only the inside of the car, what happens in the interior of the car. So when you say interiors, what pieces are you talking about specifically? Yep, for us specifically, it's uh, instrument panels, door panels, floor consoles, overhead consoles. It's the trim on the inside of the car um, that will mount electronics to, um, but it isn't the electronics themselves. If you go back in time, there was 
if you go back probably 20 years ago with General Motors and supplier integration and some of that stuff, the industry was moving to more and more consolidated interiors. So we had electronics uh, inside of JCI and we had seating and we had the trim of interiors. Uh, since that time, that's been getting peeled away. And so seating became its own business. Uh, interiors became its own business. Electronics got sold to Visteon. But now we're starting to see that turn again, where it seems like the, uh, the industry is starting to desire more integrated solutions. And we're starting to see more and more competitors of YF uh, look at how do we bring this into more of a consolidated total interior, electronics, trim, seating, and all of the components. Uh, and it's an open question for YF to figure out how we play in that space. How did that all come about of, you know, OEMs used to do all this stuff in-house. Then they started to outsource it. Then they wanted suppliers to, as you said, provide complete interior solutions. Mm -hmm. Then they went away from it. Now they're going back to it. What's been driving all that? Uh, so I can only give you my opinion more than fact. That's uh, why you're on the show. Because exactly. I've, I've got a lot of opinions. Uh, <laughs> Just make stuff up. What the hell? <laughs> Is there fact checkers on the show? Uh, so if you go back to 2000, um, from my experience, there was a very telling moment in the history of uh, JCI at the time. We had the total interior uh, award of the Delta platform for General Motors out of Europe, uh, which is their Astra platform. The previous generation Astra interior uh, didn't perform well, um, which is the language I have to use in public with customers who might be listening to the show. Um, it, it wasn't so good. So General Motors thought, well, this is our opportunity to test this supplier integration thing. We're going we're gonna to award a supplier the total interior and give them total freedom. They can design it. We did the clay. We did uh, distribution of what content should be in the car, soup to nuts, all the way into production. Uh, the media gets a hold of the car when it's done, and they say, this is unbelievable. We have never seen an automaker transform so radically from one generation to the next of an interior. This is spectacular. And we're all high-fiving each other, right? We're saying this is, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is where we're seeing the value of what a supplier could do if we're allowed to bring the technology together and, and execute it. And then we met with GM not too far after that, and they said, yeah, we're never doing that again. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but it was, we showed them the, the articles, like the, the media loved it. Uh, consumers loved it. They sold a lot more vehicles. Uh, and the results uh, that were given to us were, A, we can't be sure or certain that you will perform that well on every vehicle. And B, even if you can, we can't have one supplier. We need to have all of our suppliers to be at that level. And we don't know that we'll ever have the level of consistency that we need in order to do that. And so in order to maintain control, and I think for me personally, control becomes that vital word, we need to own the decision making and parse out individual components. And, and we will be the people who bring it together into a, a unified. And what you did was spectacular, but really what you did, we can also do. And so we're going to do what you did on the next generation. One of the things that I had heard <clears throat> is that the car companies were fearing that they were losing the knowledge the expertise. of how to do the expertise. Absolutely. And then they were afraid that suppliers were going to snow job and them and say, advantage. hey, you got to buy this and you got to buy that and do it this way. Correct. And now costs go up. I, I, I heard, it, it, coming back to your word, control. Correct. And now fast forward 20 years, well, why would it be coming back? back. Uh, and I think there's two answers to that, depending on who the customer is. Uh, in the new mobility space, it's bandwidth. If you have a, a Neo or a E-Velocity or any one of the hundred startups, I probably shouldn't have started naming them because then someone's going to say, why didn't you name mine? Right. Um, all of them have limited bandwidth. They're, they're a startup, essentially. They, they have a fair bit of money, but they, they don't have the experience, history, infrastructure that the traditional automakers have. For the traditional automakers, it's, it's a really interesting time in the industry, right? That's why uh, we have these conversations. There's this change um, that's happening in the industry relative to CASE, Connected Autonomous Shared Electric, uh, which is this really significant turn hanging over everybody's head. And all of the automakers are trying to figure out, well, what does this mean? What, what's our position? How do we react to this market change? And in that need for change, there's a recognition that, well, what better way to kind of identify opportunities than to go out to the supply base and have them do some of this with us, for us, collaboratively or in many different models. But in the last two years, and this isn't unique to Yanfeng for sure, if you had any supplier sitting in this chair, I think they would tell you the same thing. The number of opportunities to co-develop an interior or to co-innovate a technology has been dramatically different than the 24 years prior to that for my career, where they're asking for more because they know they need to change and they don't have enough 
bandwidth, even in their big company, to be able to bring in all of that new technology. They got to go find it wherever they can get it. And, and, and to what extent is, is part of this that they're redeploying their engineers into areas that they hadn't been in before? Correct. There's no history of that for them. And so that's, for me personally, and I don't uh, have personal relationships with the CEOs of the large automakers. Uh, but if you look at what Mary Berra is After doing on the show, you'll be, <laughs> yeah, for sure they'll be calling and asking <laughs> to go for dinner. about it. You know, um, why did Mary Berra close plants and lay off some of her staff, uh, significant percentages of her staff? She, she's, in my opinion, she's preparing for this turn and knowing that I need to have a lot of money in the bank to make these investments that she's making right now in cruise automation. And I don't know if you saw, they had another investment and their valuation went up. I think they're up to $19 billion valuation now. And the people that she needs working for her company are not the old metal benders. She needs people that think in terms of services and software, and she needs to become an electronics company, a software company. And you can't do that very easily by converting a metal bender into a software guy. You, you probably have to start over and hire a kid who loves coding and having that person come into the company. And then, yeah, Jim Hackett just recently with Ford, that all of those layoffs are not just about cash flow today, they're about setting the stage for how do I get the right people in my company to make this turn? What are the ramifications of all this to a guy like you whose job is innovation and mobility within a company that is doing what is arguably a traditional part of the car, the interior? It's fantastic. <laughs> um, this is by far the most interesting time to be involved in the automotive space. And that's probably true if you're in powertrain, it's probably true if you're in body, but interiors especially, everybody inside the industry, I would argue several people outside the industry, recognize that the whole stable, four seats facing forward, instrument panel, that world is changing. And so, to work in a space of innovation to say, hey, how can we bring new technology into that, into that space and create a completely different architecture? Boy, that, that would have been beating your head against the wall for the last 25 years, because automakers would say, well, that's fascinating. Good yeah. luck with that, but Change I don't care. The thread in the stitch. <laughs> exactly, but let's get back to, yeah, I want seven threads per inch instead of six. That was a really big change for us a couple years ago. Um, and so the opportunity to bring that level of change, uh, I don't know if you guys had a chance to see uh, Wi-Fi, we often call ourselves Wi-Fi, Y-F-A-I, on Automotive Interiors. Wi-Fi had a, an unveiling, a signature event of a, we call it an XIM vehicle, XIM20, Experience in Motion. And so this vehicle, is really kind of our view on, well, what does 10 years from now look like? What could it look like? And when you really take away the boundaries of, well, this is what cars have always looked like, so of course it's gonna be a slight variation of that, and you say, no, just clean sheet of paper, what would consumers want a car to be in the future? They're not gonna own it, they're not gonna park it in their driveway, I'm gonna get in this car either for a few minutes to go to the cafe around the corner, or maybe an hour if I'm gonna go across town or something like that, but that's my total experience with this vehicle. What experiences would I want to have? Because now it's not about communicating a sense of identity. That car doesn't say anything about who I am. I'm a BMW guy. Well, you know, you're just taking a ride. I want to have an experience in that car. So as we looked at that, um, it, it was really cool of an opportunity to be able to say, let's not try and create a rolling demonstrator of Wi-Fi technology. Here's the 10 things I want to sell. Hey, industrial design guys, package these 10 things so that I can take it to my customer and tell them they should buy these 10 things. To flip the script on that and say, well, no, what, what would consumers want? Let's design that and then come talk to the innovation guy and say, hey, here's technologies I need you to go figure out because this is what consumers are going to require 10 years from now. And so coming across a couple of those technologies, that it's kind of a fun one that we've been working on. Um, other people are aware of this, so it's not uh, super unique to Wi-Fi. Uh, but the whole idea of directional sound uh, has been something that's been shown at CES for the last several years. In automotive, it hasn't really taken off because in general, 
the directional sound, it, it creates kind of a Explain sound. Explain directional sound oh, is. It should start there. Uh, so we have the ability today, um, people who are far smarter than I from a physics standpoint, to be able to package sound waves in such a way that I can control their emittance in a direction. So I could actually have a projection of sound that Gary would be able to hear and John would not, even though he's sitting very close to Gary. There'd be, a, generally speaking, there's a 20 dB difference between being in the, the beam of sound and not being in the beam of sound. The problem with those technologies, generally speaking, and there's several companies that have it, is that it's, it's fixed. So you move your head around a little bit and you're, you're gonna get more or less audio. Um, so we came across a technology that actually tracks your face, tracks where your ears are, and then can actually change the direction of that sound, not mechanically, you're using software to change how the transducers are delivering the sound. And so now you can think about it not as much in a, the car that you park in your garage once again, but if I'm in a, in a shared vehicle, well, I could actually have a, somebody sitting next to me in this car that I don't know. I could have a privacy wall, and he could be listening to Metallica while I'm taking a conference call, and neither one of us has any sense of the other, even as we move around a little bit in the interior. It can track with you. Um, that technology was an idea in an Israeli garage two years ago. That technology is going to be in a car next year. Whoa, that's fast. It's like, what? That, that isn't how automotive works. Right. Well, these days it does work that way. Is it part of this co-development early on? Absolutely. So we find the technology, um, and it's a little bit of a moment of pride. I actually was in a conference with a, a competitor who shouldn't be named, and they were like, yeah, we, we met with those. We actually met them in Israel, even before they came out of Israel. It's like, oh, that's amazing. What did you do with them? Well, nothing. I mean, they were just in a garage. What were we supposed to do? Um, so we actually found them a little bit after that. We weren't first to find them, but we said, hey. We... But yes, it's completely about taking that relationship then and saying, hey, you're not automotive ready, but we're not going to get you automotive ready, which is the traditional model. Then convince ourselves at Wi-Fi that, yeah, we think you're ready. Then we bring you to an OEM, and they spend a couple years thinking that you're ready, and then you launch it for two years. and that. It's usually that eight year window from I have an idea in a garage to I'm in a car. Nowadays, to be able to come to a customer and they're asking us to do this. They're saying, give us the ideas that you're not even sure are gonna work or not. And let's jointly develop them. And if it turns out it's a bad idea, it's a bad idea, but we've gotta get that new technology in the car fast. And there's really two economic forces there. One is case, as we've been talking about. The other one is China. China has, and I attribute this a lot to their youth as an economy. They're, they're young. They've, they've only been growing for the you know, years since they've kind of emerged uh, from their past with Mao. Um, and so they're actually willing to take chances that traditional automakers, the fear of brand degradation is not as strong there because they, their consumer expects them to try new things. And so they're willing to just, hey, we'll put it on the market, and if it doesn't work out, well, then we'll... We'll take it out of the market. We'll try it and we'll take it out. Um, and so the traditional automakers in the US as well as in Europe are seeing that and realizing that other companies are moving faster than So them. do you see the US and Europe moving faster because of China? Absolutely. Um, China and Tesla, I would argue those are yeah, the yeah. two motivators <laughs> of, they found a way to get technology in the car faster than we do. Why is that? And they realize at the end of the day, those people aren't smarter or better or more capable. It's just they have a risk tolerance because they want the technology more than a traditional automaker has historically wanted it. And that's starting to change where they're saying, hey, we can't lose the race to getting technology into our cars. When I think of this directional sound, I would think that this would be coming from Bose or Harman and not from a company like Wi-Fi. Explain that. For sure. Um, and we would, uh, we may have had an argument or two inside of Wi-Fi on that topic. Um, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so really, at the end of the day, we don't view this technology as an audio solution in terms of this is going to replace all audio. Like in your uh, car, I'm, a, I'm an audiophile, I've got a Bose system or a JBL system. You're not going to replace that with this technology. This is an overlay technology that is a sensor and information communication technology that allows you to do a lot of really cool things with the interior. So we don't have to displace the audio, the traditional audio. We get to provide an, an actual service that the consumer wants over and above that. But your point is still a valid one. Um, 
And I think you're going to see more and more of this across a lot of companies, not just Wi-Fi. Several of our competitors, you see press releases on a regular basis of, hey, we're moving in this, in this direction with this technology because the new space in mobility in the interior is going to have a lot of different players. It's a reshuffling of what's needed. And so there's a desire to own that space. And in a lot of ways, it's a Wild West uh, land grab that says, hey, I, the first person that claims that space has first mover advantage. And so you're not going to see traditional audio necessarily moving into some of these kind of audio specific solutions. It, it's open to whoever delivers that solution as quickly and efficiently as possible. And I will say, Harman and uh, Bose are deep into the Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, in fact, I want to no say Harman showed me this, what they call individual sound Correct. zones. Six years ago, Correct. something like that, and Bose has already got a directional sound system in the the Nissan Kicks, mm -hmm. and it, it it's not left right fade. It surrounds Surround your sound. head. Exactly. They put speakers in the uh, the headrest, headrest to be able to do this right. too. Sound so. staging and for sure, but it's coming, and yeah. it sounds like you guys are moving real fast on it. Correct. Let's talk about uh, this whole focus at Ford that Hackett's bringing, this mm -hmm. customer-focused design. Mm -hmm. As a supplier working with them, do you see that happening? Are others working on the same thing? What do you think's going on? So just about everybody uses those words. I should mm -hmm. start there. It's like that has become a bit of a buzzword to show that you care about the consumer. Um, and I won't identify who takes it more seriously or doesn't from our perspective. But relative to Ford, that's absolutely... Uh, an initiative that is taking hold. As, as I interact with any executive leadership at Ford, th those words are used regularly, often, and uh, with financial uh, backing, if you will. Th those actions uh, show the commitment. So at Wi-Fi, we actually have a human factors and consumer research and market research group, um, which is great. So we have our own desire to say, at the end of the day, the customer gets to decide. It's never up to us to say, hey, Ford, this is the product you should, this is what consumers want, they get to decide. But if we're gonna talk to Ford about why we think a product should be in their car, it's always a lot easier to have a consumer research person talking to a consumer research person rather than me saying, well, I think it's cool. I, I'd want it in my car. Um, and so we've had a lot of activity with Ford. Um, unfortunately, I can't really name it, but multiple projects uh, in the US and in China identifying how do consumers interact with our products and what products should they, we be bringing into the market so that the consumer is getting what they want versus what the design community or the engineering community want in that vehicle? Although it's, it's, it seems to me that this is something that is, strikes me as being unique to interior companies. I mean, for, for many years, I know that, that JCI would basically have clinics and, and do things like that, which right. I mean, which always struck me as like, gee, why is a supplier doing this? And, and it sounds like this is now something that is critically important for certain types of suppliers to have. Correct. Um, and from our perspective, and you're absolutely right, Gary, we've, I've never not done this, so I don't really know what it's like to work for a company that doesn't have this capability. But when we put together a show vehicle, XIM, the XIM vehicle was not, hey, let's get six designers, put them in a room and have them sketch for a while and then we'll make whatever they come up. We did a year of research, pure quantitative research uh, in the US, Europe and China to say, what mega trends are going on out there that are gonna affect what consumers will want in 10 years relative to quality of life, relative to experience versus object of, do I need to own it or can I just interact with it? It's fascinating data on all of this stuff. And all of that then feeds the design team. Um, and if you're gonna have an opinion about what future mobility looks like, I would argue you can't really have a valid opinion unless you have some level of research to back that up of this is why I think a consumer is gonna want this. Not just, well, Gary thought it looked Cool. Um, it, it needs to be broader be and more reason for me. <laughs> exactly. You might justify it that <laughs> yeah. way. And so for sure is, and I would argue that all interior suppliers would have that same sense of we need to be able to bring solutions that aren't just an individual technology, but it's part of an overall vision of where this thing is going. Um, and I, to me, it goes back in time a little bit as well. Uh, cockpit development was something probably 20 years ago, that was kind of a big thing. Uh, all the layer builds in the OEM plants, they wanted to get that out to get more throughput in their plants, and so they outsourced that to suppliers and said, okay, you guys figure out how to get the IP, the HVAC, steering column, steering wheel, et cetera, into an assembly. Um, and it was always this question, well, who owns that? 
Should that be the HVAC supplier who kind of puts that all together and ships it in? And in the end, it was always the interior supplier. And any of my interactions with my friends at uh, any of those other subsystems would scratch their head and say, I'm selling a $200 HVAC case, and you're selling a $100 instrument panel, random numbers, scaled, but random. Um, and the electrical content in this, the displays and control heads is $300. Why does the cheapest thing in the interior actually assembling all of this and delivering it to the customer? And at the end of the day, the answer was that I gave, and I still believe this is true, is the person who's responsible for the interaction with that A surface, regardless of how much money it costs, you're actually having a voice about what the consumer is interacting with. So even if the HVAC case costs $1,000, you're just a, a piece of hardware that's getting mounted onto an experience. And the person who's responsible for the experience is the one who's gonna be responsible for the assembly. Hmm. And that's becoming more true now again as we move into a new mobility scenario where the interior is completely being recast. One of the things I've uh, learned about how Ford's uh, approaching this is that they want fast iteration with consumer feedback. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, eh, cars have always been designed for consumers, nothing new there, right? right. Mm -hmm. But instead of the design community or the engineering community saying, here's what we think is good, my understanding is mock it up fast, mill it in foam, glue tape, whatever. It doesn't have to look pretty. Low fidelity. Get real live citizens in there, not engineers, and see how these people react to it, then start iterating from there. Is that what you're seeing? Uh, we are seeing that, uh, but and, we're all. I don't just mean with Ford, I mean, yep. generally. And for sure, once again, I can only speak experientially with our, our stuff as we invent stuff that always happens. You, you start with an idea, it goes to a cardboard model, and you get a person, not, not, not you or your colleague, you actually get a person, a real live person who doesn't work in your space to come and interact with it and say, so what do you think? And then the fidelity of the model can just grow as the spend of the development grows. But also the ability to get real-time data, the cost to do that, it continues to get lower and lower. There's services out there to be able to get uh, real-time interviews with people, uh, to actually mount cameras in a car to just say, hey, I just, I just want to videotape you while you're doing, and I've got, I'm going to put a piece of technology in your car, and I just want you to interact with it for a week. And then you just get real-time data. Where, because people lie, right? That's, I don't know if that's new information yeah. for any of your uh, viewers. Yeah. But if you say, hey, what did you think about this? They will tell you what it's you great. want to hear. Yeah, or, right. yeah, people how much have would you fallen spend? out of their chairs everywhere. They're just, <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Um, I'd pay $1,000 for that. It's like, no, you wouldn't. That's a lie. Um, and so to really get honest interaction and to be able to monitor and, and measure that, how often do people actually interact with their floor console or their door. And if you ride in your car, do you typically ride with your arm on the rollover or on the armrest? Or do you keep it in your lap? Do I never touch the door at all? This is data that we're now able to collect in that environment reasonably affordably. Um, and that has a huge impact then on your decision making in terms of how you distribute content in the car. So one of the things that you guys recently did was signed an agreement with a company that makes a, a fabric material out of Paper pulp waste? Um, so it's not actually a fabric material, it's actually a resin. Okay. Um, so there's a company called Prisma, which is a division of Damtar, if that name means anything to you. It's a $6 billion pulp company. Um, again, uh, been in innovation for a long time. Lignin, uh, if you want to think about it uh, real quickly. Fiberglass, if you want to use that as an analogy. Uh, you've got cellulose, which is the glass of the fiberglass, and then the epoxy resin is the lignin. So it's just this kind of pasty glue that holds uh, the fibers together in a tree or in a blade of grass. Anything carbon-based, nature-based, has that same cellulose-lignin combination. Um, the chemistry of the lignin is a function of what plant it is. Uh, you can imagine on a blade of grass, it's, it's a reasonably wussy uh, bit of lignin. It just, it bends over, you blow the, if you've got an oak tree, man, that, that lignin is some serious lignin. Um, and so Damtar um, developed this process where you can uh, make pulp and then the off, they're basically trying to get the cellulose fibers to make all kinds of paper products. The lignin is a byproduct. They, they generally burn it. Um, not such a great thing to burn, but you can get some energy off of that, and so there's some value. But in general, it's essentially a waste product. And that's been true forever, and everybody's known that in the business forever, and so people have been scratching their head for a long time saying, man, if only there was something we could do with this stuff. And people have been trying to make kind of a plasticky kind of material out of it for a long time. The problem is it smells kind of like a natural product would smell. It kind of has a, a wood smell to it. 
And so Oak Ridge National Laboratories uh, actually did a development project where they tried to find a way to take this lignin material and turn it into a material um, that could be polymerized without that scent as a problem. They were successful. Prisma was a company that then said, well, we will be your, um, we'll buy the rights to that technology, to the patents, and we will then commercialize that. We then developed a relationship with Prisma to say, this is awesome. Um, if we could have an ABS material and for a first step, we're not planning on having it be 100% lignin based. It's kind of like the old uh, soy foam in seeds, right? They started at 5% and then they tried to work their way up. We're hoping you'd have about a 20% filler of lignin, 80% of the ABS. And it would be this wonderful situation where the material is actually about the same cost as ABS. Typically, another, maybe topic for another show, uh, society and automakers have a hard time paying for green. They want it, but they just don't feel like they can afford it. And so if you gave them a really cool green solution that costs an extra dollar, oh, I want it, but I can't afford it. So in this case, we said, hey, we, we're done offering green solutions that cost more money. This has to be a cost neutral solution. And so we got to the point where this is a cost neutral solution where 20% of the plastic is now a, an awful, a waste product of the paper process. Um, and so you really bring in that green story and you don't have a commercial inhibition associated with it. So we're hoping to bring that to market. Right now, it's gone through kind of half of our development process. Uh, we feel pretty good about it. Um, not to get too wonky on you, but the impact properties are dropping off a little bit and we're trying to reinforce that. Uh, and so we're thinking end of this year, first quarter of next year, we'll have that kind of all dialed in and it'll be a commercially available. And what, and what would you do with this? I mean, where would this be used in the interior? Uh, we would use it everywhere we could. Uh, anything that is not a surface to start with, because uh, we're a little bit nervous if you tried to mold in color um, with this material, it might not be able to get there. So, but anything that's painted, anything that's wrapped, uh, so any of your, if you want to think about components in the car, all your switch bezels are ABS, um, a lot of your wrapped components, are trim components that get cut so wrapped, a lot of those are ABS. Uh, a lot of your door components that get wrapped are ABS. I don't know the number of uh, tons of ABS that we mold every year corporately, um, but it's in tons. Uh, so you'd be able to just do an immediate 20% displacement across that, um, which we think would have a, just a fantastic green story slash commercial story to allow customers to bring this into their vehicle. Hey, we got a number of questions from viewers here. Uh, let's run through a few of them. We're, then we're going to have to take a commercial break. But if you'd like to submit a question, shoot us an email. Send it to viewermail at autoline.tv. If you're in the YouTube chat room, we're watching that too. We'd like to get them that way. You can give us a call. The phone number for that, 620-288-6546. And keep them short. <laughs> Any of your questions, shorter, simpler, more to the point, the more likely we are to use them. But we've got a few of these uh, right now. Uh, Leonard Fedorik wants to know, uh, every time he sees uh, renderings or pictures of autonomous cars, nobody's wearing seat belts. He wants to know, is that a design cue or are they just too ugly? <laughs> Or both. Uh, thanks for the question, Leonard. Uh, you're the first person to have ever asked that question. <laughs> That's not actually true. Uh, <laughs> typically, when you have a design, they are a bit unattractive, all in all, to be honest with you. Uh, and so typically, when you have a show vehicle, you'll end up having uh, cues. There, there'll be a, a retractor trim bezel. Yep. This is where the, the seatbelt retractor would go. But you don't actually have a seatbelt hanging on the seat. Um, the holy grail that, you know, if you're in the industry, you talk about all the time, but it's not next year, so it becomes a little bit of idle chatter. Once you get to a fully autonomous execution and you get to a situation where all of the vehicles are fully autonomous, well, then do I need the safety features? Uh, you start to ask questions about, well, we don't expect seat belts on school buses or RVs or conversion vans or there, there's a lot of executions in society where we say, ah, they're... That's kind of special, we don't have to worry about that. Um, the reality is, as soon as you can confirm, and there's a lot of people out there going, yeah, you'll never confirm uh, that it will be safe enough, um, you won't need any of that execution. That being said, in the interim, and open question and debate and an interesting one, it'd be better to have a beer with to have this argument, um, when does that transition happen? Is that 10 years from now? Is that 20 years from now? Um, from my perspective, it, those are real numbers that the more 
aggressive people say, boy, in 10 years, we're going to have this thing figured out. I think that's a little bit aggressive. In 20 years, some of the more conservative people think that we're going to have that figured out. So somewhere in that decade of the 30s, you're going to move to a point where you're going to have geofenced, isolated areas in cities that are uh, case only or other public transportation applications, and you'll start to not need passive safety equipment. Hmm. Here, here's a good one from Glenn W. He, he comes back to your directional sound thing. He says his Lincoln gets confused when two people are trying to use a cell phone in the car that's paired. So how is a publicly shared vehicle going to avoid this? Uh, so the technology that's unique here is that each individual person is uh, tracked, not with video footage. You can kind of get these conspiracy theories that there should be pictures of you. It's a, a little green dot matrix of your face uh, that identifies where your nose is, where your eyes are, and where your mouth is. Um, it actually doesn't track your ears, a little bit of trivia there, because people wear hats, people have long hair, a lot of times you can't see people's ears, and so it actually uh, uses an algorithm to guess, essentially, where your ears are, but it's tracking you when you get into the car and when you sit down, so it's going to give that sound to wherever you are. So if I even move over towards the passenger seat, it's still going to send the sound just to me. Gotcha. Big Barney wants to know, what happens to interiors when cars go over 500,000 miles, which we're probably going to see with ride sharing? Uh, so now you're getting into some fascinating, fascinating business development questions. Um, we expect, uh, this goes beyond just me now, um, you're almost certainly going to get to the point where your rideshare vehicles are going to be million mile vehicles. They're going to go 100,000 miles a year, they'll run for 10 years. The body's not going to wear out in that 10 years. Maybe they have to swap out batteries or motors or some of the hardware. But in general, the car is going to be uh, refreshed at least through that 10-year life of a million miles. For your interior, does the interior last for a million miles? I mean, he said 500,000. Yeah, yeah. Um, the answer is no. And so the expectation is that certainly high wear components, seating, armrests, things that you interact Carpet. with on a very regular basis, that's going to have to get swapped out multiple times. So you're going to have three separate, four separate, five separate lifespans of interior product that have to get swapped out. What does that process look like? Um, so who, first of all, who owns the car, uh, depending on if this is the city of Chicago and they have a rideshare uh, service being provided by, let's just pick on somebody, Waymo. Waymo then is going to own this car. Do they partner with a Wi-Fi to say, hey, you sold the interior in the first place. We'll let you know when these cars get to a certain uh, threshold of mileage, and then we expect you to swap these out, and you get to more of a subscription service. We don't sell the interior. We sell the service of an interior, and as soon as it wears out, we replace it, um, which then leads to a technology question, which we're maybe working on. Um, instead of saying, well, it's been 100,000 miles, I should have a new uh, armrest, widget, whatever, if I could actually, if you're sensing the person's face, can you sense what they touch? And tell me, well, I want to service that door panel after it's been loaded, 100,000 times. And if nobody ever touches the door panel, don't ever replace it. Replace based on need, not based on mileage. There's a lot of analogies to uh, the airline uh, engine industry, Rolls-Royce. They sell the service of that engine and they're tracking all of the things that are going on inside that engine. And when they start to measure uh, ab not abnormal anomalies as far as vibrations, they go and service it. They don't service it based on a number of flight hours. They do it based on the data that the engine is generating. Can the interior have a similar model? Could you service it as it needs to be serviced, not as it comes to a certain mileage amount? And that could be cleanliness, that could be smell, that could be function. There's a lot of factors that would lead to that. Yeah. So, so this, this basically changes the whole phenomenon, though, of, of what an automotive interior is and how the automotive interior is installed in a vehicle. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, does the car of the future get built at a traditional assembly plant the traditional way? I don't know. That's an open question that the market is going to test for sure. Someone's going to come up with an alternative that says, I'm going to manufacture or buy um, uh, the chassis. I'm going to manufacture or buy this top hat. And I'm going to manufacture or buy this interior. And we're going to marry it somewhere. But does that have to happen at these large, what we've grown up as normal, auto assembly plants? You're, you're talking about us going back 100 years ago. You're going back 100, that's exactly right. What's old is new. And we're going to say, boy, does that work? Oh, someone's going to try it. I guarantee it. One of the more fascinating things that I'm interested in, another one that you know, you're probably not supposed to talk about, but um, <laughs> if you're in that environment where I'm now responsible for replacing the product, th the main reason why I can't recycle the interior today is because there's no uh, return feed stream. 
you get to the useful end of your vehicle, it goes to a uh, junkyard, the battery gets recycled, right? We've got a model for that because that's high value and it's compact, I can bring it to a store. Uh, but the rest, they bring it to a shredder, uh, they take off all the ferrous metals, all the useful stuff, everything else gets bundled into an ASR, automotive treasure residue, and it goes to the landfill. And the reason why I can't take all of my stuff out of that car is because there's a bunch of landfills all over the place. There's no model or method for that component to come back to me. If the future model is I'm now servicing all that, I'm taking out the old one and putting in the new one, I now have the part that could be recycled. Well, I, I can have my own recycling center then. We could get to the point where you have 100% of that interior through the life of the vehicle and at the end of the useful life of the vehicle because it's now not... Uh, 300 million people who have cars, it's going to be a handful of service providers that have all of these cars, that material can flow back to me and I can have a 100% renewal feed stream for the interior of the car. That starts to get me pretty excited. Oh, that's pretty good. Possible. Cradle to cradle. Exactly. There is no grave. There, there is no grave. Exactly right. Okay. A couple of real quick ones. Then we got to take a break. Ray Mitrowitz wants to know, screens. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm boiling down his thing. What? What do you see going on with screens and the interiors? We argue about screens all the time. Um, and it's this open question of, do you go to the uh, Byton uh, model that has the five foot uh, A pillar to A pillar, cowl to cowl screen? Um, my answer to that is no. Uh, the Tesla model, the 17 inch uh, tablet on the front, do you go integrated? Do you go discrete with the, the Daimler where I have a separate standalone coming off of the IP? I personally believe, again, we'll just throw out opinions, uh, long term, and this has to get over the intermediate term, in the long term, screens are going to become less and less important. Why? Because the ability to interact with your vehicle is going to be seamless with the screen that you bring into the vehicle. I've got my phone. I will have an app on my phone that if this was a ride share, I called it from, we'll keep picking on Waymo, I called it from Waymo, the HVAC controls, window controls, everything the vehicle needs to do for me, I can control from that phone. So I, why do I need a display in the car to tell me what my phone is already telling me? I have my display. I, I think that's two steps away. In the intermediate step, I think we're going to take another step uh, into the, oh my gosh, we have screens everywhere, before we come back to, that was too much. Um, and I think you're going to get back to a set of displays that are pre-K, so where we still do have a driver, at least occasionally. You'll have driver information and passenger information, and you'll end up with a moderation between those two. And then there's all, I mean, you get into HUD and not HUD. Uh, there's a lot of development going on in China right now, which I think is fascinating relative to um, using a holographic image as kind of the voice of the car. So it's personification of the car. So I'm, instead of using voice to a screen with a display, I'm, I'm talking to a holographic dog, which would be creepy to me, uh, but they think it's awesome. Um, and so your screens are going to it's a fantastic time to be in the business in that regard as well, that you're gonna see just this explosion of different options, big, small, integrated, not integrated, moving, sliding, flipping, uh, and you're gonna see more and more of that for the next handful of years before we start to come back to, all right, wait a minute, what, what do we actually need here relative to consumer information? Um, explosion yeah. to consolidation. Uh, Correct. Good stuff, okay, one last question here from Spray. Is Corinthian leather still around? <laughs> Only rich <laughs> Corinthian leather, yeah. if I remember correctly. <laughs> That's right. Hey, we're going to take a stick around because uh, you know, let's talk, bring them in on the news whole thing. Uh, quick commercial break. These are the companies that make this show possible. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. 
We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. We're back. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Jeff, this is the part of the show where Dr. Data presents his number. Okay, so so we're talking we're talking about mobility, and and this is this is a this is a number that has something to do with mobility. So Katie, could you please bring the first slide up? Okay. Boulder, Colorado, Davis, California, Fort Collins, Colorado, Madison, Wisconsin, Portland, Oregon. These cities received a platinum award for what form of mobility? You want to guess first, Jeff? Uh, I would argue that those are all bicycle-friendly cities. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good guess. I was going to say uh, the little electric scooters. scooters. So, so. Oh, it's. So, so you oh. choices here. Oh, we, I didn't know it was multiple choice. Yeah. So I'm going to stick with my uh, original uh, bicycle friendly. Okay, and my, my scooters aren't there, so I'm going to, just to be different from Jeff here, I'll say foot travel. And the answer is? <laughs> bicycles. Bad. I just so, answered first, so yeah. that's... <laughs> okay, so, so why did you think all of those, those cities were... Um, Bicycle, Bicycle friendly. friendly. Um, a from research of uh, mobility solutions. Uh, I had come across some of those cities in the past of encouraging people to um, use a bike more often and actually creating infrastructure that supports that. Um, quite often in Michigan, we have rules that say you need to leave five feet for a, a biker, but people have their own discretion whether they follow that or not. Whereas in a lot of those cities, they're actually institutionalizing the infrastructure that kind of isolates the bicycle from the car. So, so it's interesting, so when I was looking at the data for this, it's, um, so in 2016, around 12.4% of Americans cycled on a regular basis. And that the number of cyclists um, has increased from around 43 million to 47.5 million people cycling in, in 2017. And so, you know, massive this massive number, it's, it's a massive number. And, and you know, and we, we've talked on the show about, you know, the scooters, as, as John was uh, uh, suggesting. And, you know, you begin to wonder, I mean, whether, you know, what is it going to look like with what you're dealing with mobility? I mean, so it's not going to all be um, powered with four wheels. It's going to be two wheels in various forms. What, what are you guys seeing in your research? Um, actually, some of the research is a little bit troubling in that as you look at the economics of connected autonomous shared electric, when I take the driver out, the driver is half the cost of a shared vehicle. So um, the cost of delivering that ride ends up being about 50 cents a mile. And so, and then you have profit margin on top of that, so who knows what the companies who deliver that will charge. But you can get to the point where an autonomous ride share is more affordable than taking the bus or the subway, which is a huge problem, because the whole point of this was to augment public transportation, to free up space on the roads, to relieve traffic congestion of people not driving well, not starting and leaving space. But if more people flow out of public transportation into ride sharing, that, that's a huge risk in all of this. Um, that needs, and other people are very aware of that and making sure that that gets managed. But at the end of the day, the first mile, last mile is always the topic in all of these things. How do I get to public transportation? How do I get to that last destination? Um, I think you're going to continue to see more and more of, whether it's biking and walking, and the, the friendliness of that, of creating the opportunity for people to get dropped off in a place where it's quite easy to get to that last bit, whether it's mechanically assisted or just on foot. Um, the smart city development, I think, is... If I had another career to do over again, I would love to be in that space to say, what could an urban environment look like if you didn't need parking? Well, that, that radically changes, changes the, whole landscape. the whole landscape of your city. And so what, to dream around what does it mean to get goods and services and people moving in a city where nobody ever stops? It's just I'm delivering something, I'm dropping something off, and then off I go again. Um, and how do I... Yeah, how do I integrate bicycles, electric scooters, ride share, scooter share? Um, there's a lot of lessons of what not to do in that space uh, over the last uh, couple of years. But I think those questions are fascinating questions that are still getting explored. What else you got, Gary, news-wise? What's going on? 
Well, um, you, you, you mentioned Tesla in passing. Um, I thought it was interesting um, this, this past week, Aurora, the um, autonomous technology development company that Chris Urmson, who had been at what was still then Google self-driving cars, Car. which became Waymo, which we've also mentioned on the show. Yep. They, they bought a LiDAR company called uh, Blackmore out of... Out of uh, a LiDAR company. A right. LiDAR company. And so I was checking on that. And so Argo AI, the company that Ford is invested in, has bought a, a LiDAR company called Princeton LifeWave, Cruise, the General Motors um, autonomous technology development company, bought a company called Strobe, Waymo has de developed its own LiDAR system, mm -hmm. and Elon Musk doesn't seem to think that LiDAR is all that good. Mm -hmm. so, so my question is, do you, think do you think Elon's missing something? Well, I would. Look, Chris Urmson knows more about autonomous vehicles than maybe anybody in the world. Right. He's forgotten more than any of us know. <laughs> That's right. I mean, this guy's going to go down in the history, but he is kind of in the history books. And there's a few others, too. But, you know, Chris has uh, certainly been front and center since before the DARPA days. So um, when you mention all these companies and they know their stuff, think that they've got to have LIDAR. And it should be pointing out the cost of LiDAR is coming, coming down, down and coming down fast. It's still expensive, but it's mm -hmm. really coming down. Yeah, I'm persuaded that uh, Tesla's missing out here. Mm -hmm. So, and speaking of coming down fast, um, Tesla stock has uh, been, coming down, <laughs> been <laughs> coming down fast. And and so there's a, there's a professor at uh, New York University, Scott Galloway, and he's uh, um, had expertise. He, he was looking at, at, at Amazon a lot. And... Uh, he actually had predicted that Amazon was going to buy Whole Foods. And at South by Southwest, he suggested that this is the year that Tesla's stock would, would really take a tumble um, to perhaps below $100 a share. And now he's, he's gotten a little bit more focused, and he believes that Tesla will be purchased by a tech company because he doesn't think traditional auto companies have enough money mm -hmm. to buy it. So, so what well, do you think about that? Well, you know, one of the rumors out there is that SpaceX will buy Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, look, that's very interesting. Um, if the car companies cannot afford to buy Tesla, what's its value going to be? I mean, if, if it drops under $100 a share, it seems to me it starts to get to be affordable. Mm -hmm. But if you're bidding against companies like Amazon and Apple and the like, lots of luck. I right. mean, they could buy you out entirely and still have cash left over. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Gary? I wonder whether Elon would allow it to happen under any circumstance. Um, I also wonder whether, um, you know, this year we're going to we're going to see him opening the plant in Shanghai um, to build vehicles. Um, we know that we have a certain trade dynamic right now between the United States and, and China that's not all that pleasant, and and whether it might not be a Chinese company that ends up buying out Tesla. Could be. I mean, it's ever who's going to pony up the most amount of money, really. Now, if Elon still has a say in it, i.e., if if the company is in an economic shambles, he, he could just lose control of it anyway. But if it comes down to a bidding war, that, that it's just going to be whoever puts the biggest bags of money on the table is going to get the company. Mm -hmm. You think it'll happen? I'm, I'm getting real nervous for Tesla. You know, I, I, I look at the company from two vantage points. One is this corporate entity that's starting to turn into this financial shambles. Mm -hmm. And the other part of it is... These really cool cars, man, are they great. So I very much want to see the company survive, but man, I, it just doesn't look good at this point. The only thing that could save Tesla right now is if sales really take off in Europe and it's able to really start making cars or even just start selling a lot of cars in China. It has to make up for the shortfall in sales that's occurred in the US. And, is it, and others were, have argued with me about this. I tie it right to the incentives, the tax rebate that you get for buying the car. The nosedive in sales ties in directly with the drop off in those subsidies. Mm -hmm. So obviously the, the huge news this week is 
FCA approaching Group Renault and saying, hey, let's get together for a 50-50 merger, okay, equal. Um, so again, looking, looking at some of the numbers, um, FCA had annual production, and this is globally FCA, and, uh, of uh, 4.57 million vehicles. Renault had 3.75 million vehicles. Uh, FCA has 199,000 employees. Uh, Renault has 183,000 employees. And I did a little math. I, I divided the number of employees into the uh, number of vehicles made, and the number came up 24 for FCA and 24 um, um, Renault. So it's it's, it's it's balanced. It's um, the FCA had revenue in 2018 of 122.5 billion dollars, net income of 3.6 billion dollars, and this is the interesting thing: Renault had revenue of 63.4 billion dollars, yet net income of 3.9 billion dollars. But remember, about 43 percent of that comes from Nissan. I think the Nissan numbers were out of this. I'll bet they're in there because it, because um, if if you look at um, you know going back to those those vehicles the uh, 4.75 million and 3.75 million if you add in the Nissan Renault Mitsubishi Alliance um, you have 15 million units that that company would be yeah. responsible for. But, but I think if you just look at purely FCA vis-a-vis uh, -vis Renault. FCA sells more cars, has more revenue, has higher EBIT, has a higher uh, market capitalization. And not by a little, you know, chunks more. And so to go to Renault and say, let's do a 50-50 joint venture, boy, I can't see how Renault cannot just jump at this opportunity. Right. To me, it's a very sweet deal for Renault. Not just for that reason, but now we all know the problems it's having with Nissan and the, the whole alliance is a mess. This really strengthens Renault's bargaining power with Nissan. Because if it brings FCA on board, Nissan is no longer the larger, richer partner. Mm -hmm. This Renault FCA combination is the larger, richer one. So I think Renault is going to jump at the opportunity. Um, selfishly, for somebody who lives in Southeast Michigan, I don't like the deal because there's no American voice whatsoever in the new structure of the company. And what are Renault and, nice, uh, and FCA worried about? They're worried about Europe. You know, their plants are operating, I just read it, 65% manufacturing capacity. I guarantee you that means they're all losing money. Uh, the European market is in the doldrums. The margins with the cost of capital is not enough to feed the voracious CapEx beast that's got to be fed. And so uh, I think the city of Detroit, for example, is very lucky FCA already announced it is going to build a new plant here because under that new structure, they would go, no, 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 we need manufacturing jobs added in Europe. And I'm also worried because, you know, when Sergio Marcioni wrote his Confessions of a Capital Junkie, what he really focused in on more than anything else was powertrain. Mm -hmm. Because every automaker in the world seems to build a two liter turbocharged four cylinder engine. They all make transmissions that are essentially the same size with the same amount of gears in them. And he's going, this is nuts. We're all developing and engineering and manufacturing this. It's all the same. The public doesn't care. So we need to consolidate on that basis. They're not going to consolidate in Europe. But but one of the things they're going to cut jobs in Auburn Hills. So I mean, but one of the things that Sergio missed was what Jeff was talking about that we're going to have vehicles that are going to be electric mm -hmm. or at the very least electrified yeah. and at some level autonomous and we've not seen FCA do much in the way of investing in either of those areas. I mean, yeah, they cut the deal with, with Waymo, Waymo, but, but, ba but basically it means, yeah, we sell cars to Waymo and then we'll install right. this stuff. You know, in terms of electrification, um, what can you get right now that's an electric vehicle in this market from FCA. Only the electric 500. That's right. right. Yeah. And, and Nobody and, wants and, it. And, 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 <laughs> Good luck finding one. Yeah, I was going to say, they're like hen's teeth. You, you can't get them. I mean, and so, so Renault has, has, has much better technology in terms of at least electric. You look at Europe, where you're beginning to have, you know, really clamping down on emissions, and that's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. um, What's FCA to do? They, no, I, look, they don't I, have the technology. Gary, I totally understand. 
FCA needs to do a merger. I completely understand. I also completely understand there have got to be cuts. You're not going to put these companies together and just leave everybody in place as is. No, you're going to say we have overlap in all these corporate functions. Mm -hmm. Let's start cutting heads. I'm just saying, as somebody who lives in southeast Michigan, I believe the cuts are going to come in Auburn Hills. They're not going to come in France. They're not going to come in Italy. Right. Because as we know, trying to get rid of people in Europe is lots of luck, man. It is so hard to do. It'll be so much easier to cut jobs in the United States. And, you know, the, the thing that I, I mean, I, I, was, I was doing some, some research on um, the history of the auto industry of late. And I mean, in, in the, in, in when I was looking at, at what happened, you know, 08, 09 in, you know, the auto industry in Detroit in particular, I mean, the fact that, you know, we, we still sort of think of, of FCA as being an American company in some regard. You know, I mean, the Chrysler part is still there, and, and many of us still refer to it as Chrysler. And, and uh, I mean, it, it's an Italian company. It is. No, it totally is. But, you know, uh, in its structure, it completely is. But the heft of the company, the, the engineering powerhouse, the, the manufacturing powerhouse, the profit powerhouse mm -hmm. is all in Auburn Hills. Right. It's not over in Torino. I'm sorry, it's not. And so I understand this is the way of the world. And, you know, I, I was trying to think back in my mind, who would I blame for the, all this happening? <laughs> you know, you could blame Cerberus, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it goes back before that, Daimler Chrysler, and okay, when, so, so, so when for Daimler those who don't, spun it off. Okay, for those who don't have this inside baseball, so yeah. basically Cerberus, which was a venture capital firm, bought Chrysler from Daimler. So that's right. where, you know, so it was Daimler Chrysler, and, and then Cerberus came in. Right. And, and brought in, in Mr. Fact, Nardelli. In fact, if you sort it all out, Daimler essentially just gifted the company to them. But... I, as I've been thinking sort of, about it. Sort of the same way that, that the federal government gifted Chrysler <laughs> right. to Fiat. Right. So Daimler Chrysler really destroyed the company. And I sort of was thinking, well, I'm going to blame Bob Eaton because, you know, Bob Eaton did deal. the deal. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, you know what? No, it's all Lee Iacocca's fault. <laughs> We're back to rich Corinthian leather. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my logic. If Iacocca hadn't been so pissed off at Bob Lutz, they came to hate each other's guts. Right. So much so that even though Lutz was a terrific executive, Iacocca let his emotions get the better of him, and he said, I'm putting Bob Eaton in charge. Mm -hmm. If Lutz had been with the company Daimler Chrysler, I believe would have never happened yeah. because Chrysler was actually doing a lot of stuff together with BMW. And I believe that there would have been a BMW Chrysler alliance instead. There would never would have been a Daimler Chrysler, which never would have been led to uh, a Cerberus, which never would have left Chrysler with a broken back. So when the recession came, it was bankrupt. And only Sergio said, I'll take it on. Thank God he did. Right. But make no mistake, it is now Chrysler that's bailing out Fiat. In fact, if Daimler Chrysler or if Fiat Chrysler had not happened, Fiat would have already gone bankrupt. So I go all the way back to the, the late 90s, and if Iacocca hadn't have been so pissed off at Lutz, none of this would have happened. All right, all right. one question for you and one question for, for <laughs> Jeff. Okay, the question for you is, will the FCA-Renault merger happen, yes or no? Yes. And to you, Jeff, what would the impact of something like this be on suppliers, I mean, Wi-Fi as well as as, as as anybody else. I mean, just I'm just just what what is your sense of it? Yeah, it's probably a boring answer, but at the end of the day, you're just moving pieces on a chessboard. Uh, so that particular customer just got a little bit bigger as it merged, and another customer gets a little bit smaller. But we're going to sell to whoever you're going to sell to them. But they're now they're going to say, "Hey, more volume, right. lower your prices." That is that is not a new uh, negotiation. <laughs> no, no, it is. That's, that's right. We're pretty familiar with that yeah, yeah. Uh, discussion. <laughs> so, but I mean, does does it surprise you in any way that I mean, we've been talking for years and years and years about how the industry's too big. There needs to be consolidation. What consolidation have we seen? Mm -hmm nearly nothing right and maybe this is going to happen I, I i found it interesting uh carlos Tavares is is who who is trying to romance fca basically he's like oh you know the the, the fca is taking advantage of, of it's Renault. an italian takeover yeah i mean it's just <laughs> like it's ridiculous but 
you know, it, 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 it's just it's, it's striking to me that we're not seeing this. And then, in, in light of, of if we get to case, I mean, as you, as you were suggesting earlier, there's not going to be as much private ownership of vehicles. Now, maybe this is not going to be until 2030 or at some mm -hmm. point in time, but, but still. Right. It's not it, our grandkids. It's us, right? right. We're, we're going to see it. And, and, you know, and, and what does that do to the economics of the whole thing? I mean, what does it do to the economics of a car company? What does it do to the economics of a supplier company? It explodes the economics of everybody, is my, our position. Um, every automaker that we deal with is scared sounds pejorative like they're but they're anxious concerned. they're concerned they're not going to yeah. be able to make the turn every single automaker is nervous and concerned about whether they're going to be relevant post the movement into this shared mobility space right and i think a fascinating question that comes out of that uh which you didn't ask me by the way but apple's <laughs> going to buy tesla and it's going to happen in the next year or two that's, okay I'll, I'll go on record of saying that's been my uh, rumor that i've been fostering for two years now all right so i, I got one more year before i run out of time <laughs> no insider information there i take that to the bank um, why, do you, why do you think that by the way uh, because Apple wants to be in the automotive space. They've been very public about that. Uh, they're not going to be able to develop the capability to build their own car very easily. So they're going to need to buy somebody. I might as well buy somebody that has kind of a cool panache associated with them anyway. And now I can just morph that over to an Apple cool, more white, more aluminum. And they'll hire, <laughs> they'll hire somebody to run the business. They have no interest in running an automotive company, but they need that platform to deliver their services. And so they'll hire some automotive executives, not Elon Musk, to actually run an efficient operation that they convert into. Tesla will become their Foxconn. I, I like this idea because, you know, one of the questions has been if Tesla goes belly up and Elon has to move, does the brand lose its panache because he is so much part of Associated that brand? That. Right. But if Apple got it, no problem. You've just displaced it with That's another. That's what I think. Right. Hey, uh, uh, we, we're one more year. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You got one year. Uh, uh, just a fascinating question that I struggle with, and I would be curious to get your opinions. And maybe we don't have time on today's show, but there's this question that's out there in the marketplace of so Waymo is in the lead in terms of developing systems. Uh, light our conversation earlier. Uh, they've got the most miles without disruption. Uh, they're in the lead. Who actually is going to succeed in this environment? If you go back to historical analogies again, uh, the graphical user interface was developed by Xerox. They had a working model. They were big and cash rich, and they said, no, not yet. The not mouse. Yet, not yet, the mouse. And Steve Jobs comes along and says, what the? Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing that next year, Macintosh. Next thing you know, is it going to be the small startup company that's running autonomous uh, ride share in the retirement home that then also adds the amusement yeah. park and then yeah. adds and then adds? Right. Or is it going to be the tech giant, Waymo, Amazon, Apple, whatever, are we in a Xerox Apple story or are we in a different kind of story? I like this. That's yeah. a question that I wrestle with often because from a business standpoint, you have to make bets on who, who are you wanting to work with? Who's going to win? It's an open question of who's actually going to come out the other end. Waymo has all the money. They're in the lead. I wouldn't bet against them, frankly, but there's a lot of little players that are doing disruptive things okay, but locally. Is, but, but, is, but isn't this industry predicated on scale and therefore Waymo has the scale? And the little startup who, you know, has some mm -hmm. company isn't going to have that, and they're going to be gobbled up. Because, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, the aforementioned uh, Aurora, I mean, mm -hmm. they're making partnerships with Hyundai and BMW and, and mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and so they, they realize that if they're going to get traction, mm -hmm. they need to be with a larger company. So I Although, I, you know, just to jump in on it, this May Mobility, mm -hmm. startup here from Ann Arbor, right? Where do they get their product from? Polaris. Right. Who's one of their, their funders? Toyota. You know, uh, Toyota Ventures has put money into them. They're already out there running low-speed, geofenced, fully autonomous vehicles. And, you know, so to your point, they're gaining real live world experience right now before Waymo uh, has really started to scale up. Right. And the scale question is another fascinating one that today, and it, I soak in this all day, every day, and some people don't, but today, scale is, it's everything. You, Chrysler can't, FCA, I, I did what you, yeah. FCA <laughs> can't survive because they're the seventh largest automaker. They need, to, tomorrow, is scale required? Scale is required at the manufacturing level, but I don't think Waymo is going to manufacture a car either. I, maybe they will, but I doubt. They're going to provide the service. Well, what scale do I need for that service providing? It could be that you have a series of really small, 
service providers that do different cities or different Best Buy could have their own service yeah. providing division to have Best Buy activities happening in that rideshare car. Are you going to get this? We've kind of aggregated over the years into these top automakers. Are you going to in the future get to the point where you've got? That's how I see it. I, I've said that I, I believe we're going into a world where scale is going to become a disability. It's so, going to be a burden. So, so what, 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 does, what, does, what does a car company sell then? You're asking the most dangerous question in the world in my mind, because I think in the world of future mobility, the car maker only sells cost. You are the lowest cost provider because the service provider is selling brand, they're selling experience, they're selling consumer interaction. The person who made that car, the brand is irrelevant. So, so basically, if we, if we look at car companies today, in addition to the scale that predicated on manufacturing mm -hmm. and so on, is, is that, okay, so there's, there's something about a Malibu that is different than something about a Camry, which is different than something about an Altima, which is different than something about a Fusion, mm -hmm. and all of that is just basically marketing and perception and brand. Correct. That all goes away. That all goes away. So suddenly, the thing that makes the car company's money, which is the differentiation predicated on brand, and is image. gone. Is gone. gone. That's, That's right. why I said it's the most frightening question so, so, that I ask myself. This is why all the OEMs want to get into the mobility services themselves, because this is what they see coming. But, I mean, how do they exist? I mean, because, because basically a large portion of their revenue goes away. Or not, in the sense that, here's what GM says, that right now today, mm -hmm. on an average, worldwide, it gets $30,000 in revenue for every vehicle that it mm -hmm. sells. It says, this is GM talking, with GM Cruise, with a fully autonomous vehicle providing ride sharing, they expect to make $300,000 in revenue on that vehicle. Mm -hmm. So if they control the ride share experience. Exactly. And that's the yeah, critical yeah, yeah. variable. Right. See, and the thing that I wonder about, though, is, is that so week before last, we didn't talk about this on the show, so I can, I can bring this up. But, <laughs> but, you know, General Motors saying, you know what? Maven isn't working out so well. We're going to have to we're going to have to retract on that. Mm -hmm. Ford, which was operating Chariot in right. places like San Francisco and New York City, we're saying, you know what, you know this this isn't this isn't working out so well for us. So I begin to have the question: Is the ability to execute in rideshare operations is this something that is within the ballpark of car companies, or is this something that they're just not very good at? They don't know it. I go back to my earlier statement about Mary Barra. She's letting go a bunch of metal benders because she needs to hire a bunch of people to figure out the answer to that exact question. Because if cruise automation is just making a car that's capable of being driven around or not being autonomously being uh, ferried about, they're going to be a manufacturer, and the manufacturer is not going to make the profit. And, 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 you know, and we just keep thinking in the context of, of okay, it's a, it's a car, it's transportation, you know, whether it's a, you know, a shared mobility sort of thing, and, and therefore it's got to be a car company or somebody like Lyft or somebody like Uber. But, you know, why not Ritz-Carlton? Absolutely. I mean, why not? I mean, isn't is I mean, don't you want to have a you know? If you were talking Premium about the word, experience, you're talking about experience before. Absolutely. I mean, and so so you know, you begin to associate different things with you know. Maybe you want a car by ESPN because you're going to get into this thing. It's going to be full of screens. And it's going to be showing you all kinds of. Sp I mean, it, it maybe it isn't a car company at all. No, I. I this is what scares me about the future right. for the automotive industry. Right. Because, you know, if you go back about 40 years ago, there was a big talk in uh, the business schools. I think it came out of Harvard Business School. The problem with the railroads, which used to dominate transportation, personal transportation in, in the United States, is they didn't realize they were in the transportation business. Mm -hmm. All they thought of themselves as was train companies. Mm -hmm. And if they had only thought about that they were in the transportation business, they would have been able to adopt to the automobile, to which I go, no way, no way in hell. <laughs> they knew nothing about the automobile, right. nothing whatsoever. They had no expert, they were goddamn good train companies. These guys knew how to run the trains on time and move stuff all over the country. And so when we talk all about the automakers getting into the mobility service, do they know anything about it? Not at all. They're really goddamn good at making, making cars. cars. Boy, do they know how to do that better than anybody. And that's my fear for the industry is that it's, it doesn't have the skill set for this new emerging technology whatsoever.
which goes back to your point of Mary Barra desperately trying to hire these people so she right. can have a company that she'll you know, leave as a legacy to someone who will follow her. And from my perspective, globally, Mary Barra is in the lead. I totally agree. GM is the only company, car company in the world that is deliberately trying to shrink its manufacturing footprint. Correct. The only one. Ford, maybe to a little degree now, they're starting to watch what Mary's done. But uh, if you believe we're going into a world where we're not going to need as many cars, scale is going to be a disadvantage, and the bigger they are, the harder they'll fall. Fascinating world, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's a fascinating world. <laughs> but whatever vehicles are out there are still going to need interiors, so you're good I'm to go. Good <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, just need to, they need to want our interiors. That's right. Although just as a real quick response to your last comment, Gary, about uh, Best Buy and ESPN, this has very significant business implications to us that we're looking at right now, even though it's 10 years from now, because our expectation, which is an extension of a trend that's already happening, is the number of variants of a, on a platform is just going to explode, and the volume per variant is going to go, not to zero, but something approaching zero. Scale is not only important to automakers, it's important to us as suppliers. We make these investments, and we really only make money on vehicles where they sell choose a number, 50,000, 100,000 a year, anything in the 10, 20, 30,000 unit per year range, you do that as a favor so that you, you get the real program that comes later. If all future programs are 10,000 units a year, uh-oh, I, I need to figure out as a company, as a supplier, how do we, how do, we do that? Because we think that's what's coming. You're gonna, you're gonna get a couple of really large volume kind of people mover, low cost kind of micro bus, robo taxi type interior. But if you're gonna have a custom ESPN interior, how many of those are there gonna be? Um, and maybe you can retrofit it uh, quickly to be somebody else's interior. But in general, you're gonna have custom interiors by brand and you gotta find a way to deliver that affordably. We have no idea how to do that today. But you're thinking about it. But we it. are. Yeah. We're, not, we're doing more than thinking about it. Right. But I mean, but see, but, but, but we're preparing for that eventual reality. And, and isn't this a situation that all suppliers are going to face in Absolutely. some way, shape, or form, regardless of what they're making? That yes. that it's suddenly it's 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 yeah. different. It isn't this. It isn't the like okay, you know, we make more and we we make more units and we make more money. Correct. Yeah. Different world. Very different world. In fact, I, I hope the audience appreciates all this because I'm telling you, there's somebody out there right, right now watching the show going, I got an idea. And that's what's beautiful about all this change is somebody out there has got the answer. Right. And so, now's the time. And now's the time. And, Look, you, and you'll probably find them. I mean, if I'm you, looking for if them. If yeah, you're yeah. finding these guys in garages yeah. in 1 800 Israel. call me. Yeah, yeah, You've yeah. got a really cool idea. Yeah. Well, good. <laughs> Well, let's wrap this up. Okay. Jeff Stout, thanks so much for coming yeah, on. This has been a brilliant yeah. show, man. This has been really yeah. good. Yeah. Good. This is this is great stuff. I'm just uh and, and as you say, John, I mean it's 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 you know the discussion we're having here is I mean, ten years may seem like a long time, but in this industry, it's not at all. Nothing. It's nothing. Two design cycles. Yeah, and it's 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 the implications are just astonishing. So thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Well good. <laughs> thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv. Hey, uh, for those of you who are still watching, we, we let's get to some of the, uh, the questions and stuff like that. Uh, these are more comments. Levante A says, I'd rather see FCA merged with PSA than Renault. I kind of agree with that because I think the whole Renault Nissan alliance, who wants to get involved in that <laughs> quagmire? Uh, chat room comments on LIDAR. Big Barney says, I think the LIDAR uh, will be completely obsolete. Interesting. Ron, Ryan uh, Huber says, I think all humans will be required to have LIDAR implanted in their face <laughs> to get a driver's license. <laughs> Portable lighter, personal lighter. <laughs> That's good. Alan B. says, we won't have to clog the roads with a car just to get a half gallon of milk. That's good. Brent McKinney says, even the Waymo leading engineer said that Musk was right. That's interesting. 
Uh, I hadn't heard that. I hadn't heard uh, that either. Uh, fact check that one. That'd be interesting. Casey Auto Doctor points out that uh, Elon developed a LIDAR system for SpaceX rockets to dock with the International Space Station. Even Elon's talked about that. Right. He said, he yeah, for technology. Yeah, exactly like that. Uh, Gary Saya says, is Young Fung going to buy IAC? <laughs> You probably can't. can't don't, don't, don't answer that. You'll get in trouble no matter what right. you say. Uh, uh, Marty Boyle Davis says, do we, are, does our guest know anything about the specific technology that will play a role in making material combinations that will both make sense and respond to user? I, I think you talked about that with the lignin and all this, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know. Sure, natural materials is for sure. Stuff. I kind of mentioned le leather at the beginning of the show. That's kind of a theme now, the Corinthian leather. The vegan leather uh, concept is a strong movement by new mobility customers where they don't want to actually have cow leather. They want to have something artificial. Yeah. Um, and so new materials and textiles. And what does luxury mean in a new mobility space? It's not wood, leather anymore. You're now moving into alternative materials. That's interesting. But would it well. be faked leather? I mean, sort of like, uh, you know, um, um, the... Impossible burger, you know. We, we, you know <laughs> it's in that no, vein, exactly. Yeah, no, nobody wants to have a real beef burger, so we'll have this this uh, plant-based burger that right. seems so like yeah. There's traditional solutions that are still oil-based, right? PUR based materials, so leatherette it quite often gets referred to. But looking to get out of oil altogether and in, inappropriate materials. How do we get to kind of authentic uh, materials? and let that be luxury. And so you're seeing a real strong push still for textiles and natural textiles as being a, a more luxurious- I love leather. cloth. I prefer cloth over leather myself. Right. That mindset of cloth being the base version is yeah. starting to get turned on its head. Yeah. Okay, a couple of more. Other, here, here's one for you then, uh, Gary. Barry Rector from Indy. Do you think Sergio was working on the merger with Renault before his untimely death. No. I don't either. Do you think he'd be happy with it? Yes. Yeah, I do too. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we've got a, a phone call from Dale, also about FCA. Carmen, let's bring that in. Hi, John. This is Dale Leonard out of Cleveland, Ohio. Just one quick comment regarding the FCA merger. I think if this deal goes through, everything will disappear except Jeep. And we do not need to lose more American brands in this country. Great show. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks for that comment, Dale. I, I think I'd ra add Ram pickups. In, in the, they're, they're going to survive. <laughs> and, and then if you think about it, I mean, what is Chrysler brand right now? In North America. Right. It's basically 200, 300, 300. That's all. The 200 is gone, right? So you have the 300 in the yep. Pacifica. That's right. it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then you've got Dodge, which basically has, you know, uh, Challenger, Charger, Challenger, and Journey, Durango. and Durango. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's it. So, I mean, there's, there's really not much uh, there. Except for one thing. You know, FCA is pouring all this money into Maserati and Alfa Romeo. It isn't working. Right. Maserati is a basket case right, right. now. Alfa has come nowhere near the meeting. I, I looked up the numbers. Chrysler Dodge minivans just in the United States outsell Alpha and Maserati on a global basis by a big whopping margin. And I'll bet they make more, more profit. Money. Right. And, and if, you, if you go back to, I mean, you know, God bless Sergio and hope he's doing well wherever he's at, um, that his, if, if you go back to his initial five-year plans when he was, he was rolling it all out, if, if you look at that, he basically predicated a lot of his thinking about Maserati and on, on, on Alpha that Americans would just love to snap up the Italian design and right. we just couldn't wait to get that on, you know, and, and that was just going to explode. <laughs> and really, Italian design? That's, that's, <laughs> well, you know, it's, he's kind of, you know, look, the Stelvio, the Julia, beautiful, beautiful. vehicles. Come beautiful on. vehicles. They're just not selling. Right. right. And, and, and many people, I mean, have had uh, mechanical problems with them. I mean, many of the guys who were reviewing them and, right, and, 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 and uh, it's just yeah. like, so, you know, not, not everything works out as planned. And, and, uh, and yes, it'd be disappointing if we lose Chrysler, or we lose Dodge. Uh, look, um, I, I, to Dale's point, I, uh, my fear for those brands is that, uh, FCA now with Renault are going to say, look, there's more profit potential in these luxury brands. So let's not invest in Chrysler and Dodge. We've got to take that money and put it into Alpha and Maserati. And, uh, you know, 
at some point you got to say money throwing money. more money is not okay, going to solve but, it. Okay, but do you think that 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 Mike Manley would would allow that to happen? He I mean, mean, I mean, I think he's smart enough to basically say, you know what, we're making all the money on trucks and Jeeps. Let's proliferate this Jeep thing, which they've been doing. And, you know, they're building Jeeps in Italy right now and, and you know, everywhere else. Fiat alive. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think he's just going to say more of that. You know, that that's what we need to be doing. And, and uh, you know, if if Chrysler fades into the sunset, I mean, yes, it'll be sad for us who who know and remember Chrysler, but you know, for a younger generation, it's like, what the hell is a Chrysler? You right. know, it's just like, oh, my mom had one of those. It was a minivan. Right. Yeah, you know, brands come and go, and I, I never shed any tears over Pontiac and Oldsmobile and all that, but there's jobs connected with this. There's people in Auburn Hills that are designing and engineering these things that are connected with it. And I'm, I, I've said, I'm being very selfish about it. As somebody who lives in Southeast Michigan, I think this is going to be bad for our region. I fully accept the fact that FCA needs to have a merger. I fully accept the fact that there's going to have to be cuts. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying the American side of the operation is going to bear the bigger brunt of it all. So, so who, yeah. would you, who would you rather them merge with that this would not well, be a consequence? Well, you know, I, no, I, I, I wish Iacocca had not been so pissed off at Bob Lutz. <laughs> we can't go back there. <laughs> I know, that train left the station, but it, look. I mean, Ford's not going to buy them. No. No. General Motors, as no, we said, has no. been shrinking well, their, they their footprint. Back. They're not going to get them. Only one other car company has stepped to the fore that's shown an interest, and that was Guangzhou in, in China. And, uh, but, and maybe Guangzhou would be, from my selfish standpoint, a better partner. Mm -hmm. Because all Renault and Fiat are trying to do is put a tourniquet on their European operations. Um, and that doesn't benefit any, there's no synergy to be gained from this merger in North America. None. Zip. Whereas if it were a Guangzhou, and I, 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 I'm not arguing in favor of that. All I'm saying is that Guangzhou would much more need the American operations than uh, Fiat or PSA or, or uh, Renault are going to need. Yeah, I would vote Great Wall if I had a vote. There was that rumor a year or so ago. Great Wall would be. They're a Jeep-like expert. That's all they do is SUVs only in China. I bring in an SUV expert out of the U.S. and you become an SUV brand globally. I think that could lead to some really interesting things yeah. for the U.S. and new product for Europe mm. and China. But. <coughs> okay, let's right. officially wrap up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>